hidden agenda. Who are we? It appears we've become victims of our own society. Brothers and sisters, please wake up. We invented things like the spark plug and the lubricating cup. We helped build this country from the ground up. Fried chicken, collard greens, cornbread, soul music, and even the folding bed. Rap, gospel, and R&B. Even the forever famous golf tee. Albeit, we still succumb to higher interest rates with mortgages and car notes we can't even make drugs and liquor stores outside our front doors. Why did this happen? This isn't the vision of our forefathers who fought and died for us. So why are the majority of us left holding the short end of the stick? Did you know a black man invented the automatic gear shift? Life is short, family. Go ahead and soar because our lineage consists of great people like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Nina Simone, Maya Angelou, and so many more. There is so much untapped natural ability and potential for us to explore. Dare you to ask our Savior which door you should walk through before you give up and give in to an agenda that doesn't include you. Did you know that in the Bible there's an indicator that will mark the end of the age that's relevant to us right now? That indicator is found in the book of Matthew. Some think that this scripture is talking about different places in the world revolting against other places, but that isn't the case at all. In this text, the writer, who is Matthew, is referring to nations as nationalities. Even though nations do rise against other nations in world history, and even in the present, this doesn't eliminate the idea that citizens or ethnically related people of other nations dwelling in the same country will revolt against people of nations different from their own. This statement is found in Matthew, the 24th chapter, the 7th verse, and it reads, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. In this passage, the word nation indicates the difference in nationality as it continues to disseminate the difference between the people and their region or origin by saying, and kingdom against kingdom. So in essence, this is referring to racial tension that will begin to become more common in the last days. It's safe to say that if what the word of God says is true, which it is, that we are living in the last days. So let's look at this as a warning that time is winding up. So in this episode of Word on the Street with JP, we'll also be looking at the root and origin of this age-old phenomena and how there is nothing new under the sun. So don't you touch that dial. Before I get started, I want to say, I hope you feel my heart on this matter and that this broadcast is in by no means meant to offend anyone, just states the truth and how we as believers 
should see through the glass clearly and not be dissuaded or deceived into thinking something else. And so some may not agree with what I'm about to teach on, and some may. I hope you do. And I just want to help those who are seeking answers to find them. There's no doubt that war has been waged against people of color. There's also no doubt that incidents between people of color are being cast on every media device and social media platform. I wanted to say that this is not meant to be racially fueled as a teaching because it's not. One of the key weapons of the enemy is racial and social injustice, and that would be the truth. And I would have to agree in part. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not taking away from the disenfranchisation of the underserved by any means because it's real, but we have to see it for what it really is. And we have to agree that there is black on black crime. There's white on white crime, brown on brown crime, yellow on yellow crime, red on red crime. But the fact of the matter is that there are instances concerning all ethnic groups, but the one that is being exhausted in the news and media is white on black or black on white. So why don't we hear about the others as often? I'd venture to say that the reason is because the social injustice and racially motivated attacks on men and women of color is the one that gets the masses tanked up and is fueled by this nation's experience with slavery. But people of every nationality all over the world have been enslaved and, and treated less than humane throughout history. But this country seems to be consumed with the injustices that came out of the African slave trade. The fact of the matter is that there is absolutely nothing that can change the fact that this has happened. Retaliation because of a historical event may feel good, but the real answer is to equal the playing field nonviolently and elect people that can not only introduce legislation that will bring about change and equality, but those who can actually get that legislation passed, not just introduced. And until then, we must seek the Lord on how to endure and ask him for a clearer line of sight. So let's ask him for a heart for all people and not just our own racial class. For the word of God doesn't indicate that we should love our brothers or sisters that are of the same racial class. It says that we should love one another equal to our love for God. The race card is being used today to fuel the evil that seems to be taken over, not just our nation, but the entire world. But I'll go out on a limb and say that the race issue is only the clothes in which this evil is dressed up in. The truth is that we are fighting against good and evil, not against black and white. The real fight is between the righteous and the unrighteous, according to the word of God. And race has a big part to play. I agree. But some wouldn't ever come out and say it, but I will. Some are motivated to continue to play this race card so they can use the excuse to continue in unchrist like behavior. I have friends of all nationalities. I do business and sit on boards with them as well. And being an African American, I can't expect one of my white counterparts to feel guilty of how their ancestors treated mine. That's just not fair, especially in the body of Christ if we all call ourselves Christians. They have no skin in the game and shouldn't have to bear the burden every time we meet. This ideology is so ingrained in us that every time someone cuts us off in traffic, we all pull that race card out and start reading it when it has absolutely nothing to do with race at all, but has everything to do with the offender being an opportunist or just plain inconsiderate. We always say things like, now, why did that white guy just cut me off? Or where did that Hispanic get their license? Walmart? Now, I must admit 
that I've done it too. And there may or may not be an attitude of entitlement that may or may not come with having a relationship with people of other races. But if we are all truly members of the body of Christ, we should resist that way of thinking and strive to operate in love and patience towards one another. Whether black or white, if we all are one in Christ, there should be no racial issues between us at all. I know that this may seem a little idealistic, but the truth is the truth. We should constantly be in love mode for everybody, or at least strive to get there. Black, brown, white, red, and tan. We can't seem to do that because there are some who call themselves Christians who thrive on so-called race-related incidents and have built a platform for themselves. I want to read you something that was published by NPR on February the 10th, 2017. It's about Frederick Douglass. It says, Douglass was born on a plantation in Eastern Maryland in 1817 or 1818. He didn't know his birthday, much less have a long form birth certificate to a black mother from whom he was separated as a boy and a white father whom he never knew and who was likely the master of the house. He was parceled out to serve members of the family his childhood was marked by hunger and cold, and his teen years passed in one long stretch of hard labor, coma-like fatigue, routine floggings, hunger, and other commonplace tortures from the slavery handbook. At age 20, he ran away to New York and started his new life as an anti-slavery orator and activist. Acutely conscious of being a literary witness to the inhumane constitution he had escaped, he made sure to document his life in not one but three autobiographies. His memoirs bring alive the immoral mechanics of slavery and its weapons of control, chief among them food. Hunger was the young Fred's faithful boyhood companion. I've often been so pinched with hunger, I have fought with the dog, Old Nep for the smallest crumbs that fell from the kitchen table and have been glad when I won a single crumb in the combat, he wrote in my bondage and freedom. Many times have I followed with eager step the waiting girl when she went out to shake the tablecloth to get the crumbs and small bones flung out for the cats. As a young enslaved boy in Baltimore, Frederick Douglass bartered pieces of bread for lessons in literacy. His teachers were white neighborhood kids who could read and write, but had no food. At 20, he ran away to New York and started his new life as an anti-slavery orator and activist. Never mind, honey, better day coming, the elders would say, to solace the orphan boy. It was not just the family pets the child had to compete with. One of the most debasing scenes in Douglass's first memoir, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, describes the way he ate. Our food was coarse cornmeal boiled. This is called mush. It was put into a large wooden tray or trough and set down upon the ground. The children were then called, like so many pigs, and like so many pigs, they would come and devour the mush some with oyster shells, others with pieces of shingle, some with naked hands, and none with spoons. He that ate fastest got most. He that was the strongest secured the best place, and few left the trough satisfied. Douglas makes it a point to nail the boastful lie put out by slaveholders, one that persists to this day, that their slaves enjoy more of the physical comforts of life than the peasantry of any country in the world. In truth, rations consisted of a monthly allowance of a bushel of third-rate corn, pickled pork, which was often tainted, and porous quality herrings, barely enough to sustain grown men and women through their back-breaking labors in the field. Not all the enslaved, however, were so ill-fed. Waiting at the glittering table of the great house, a table loaded with the choicest meats, the bounty of the Chesapeake Bay, 
platters of fruit, asparagus, celery, and cauliflower, cheese, butter, cream, and the finest wines and brandies from France was a group of black servants chosen for their loyalty and comely looks. These glossy servants constituted a sort of black aristocracy, wrote Douglas. By elevating them, the slave owner was playing the old divide and rule trick, and it worked. The difference, Douglas wrote, between these favored few and the sorrow and hunger-smitten multitudes of the quarter and the field was immense. I got that from www.npr.org. So, as an African-American man, I must admit that reading that was disturbing for me. I can't imagine what it must have been like being a slave, a person treated in such an inhumane way what it took to stay alive and to even want to continue to live knowing that today's treatment would just reoccur tomorrow. Whew, wow, what a resilience they must have had. So now let's look at it from another standpoint. Here we go. Okay, put your seatbelts on. Imagine landing on a beach that was unfamiliar in search of game, but not just any game but game of the human type. You are there to kidnap other human beings so you can put them to work in an economy that was fueled by free labor in a land far away. Even though your weapons are more advanced than those of the people you intend on capturing, the odds are still stacked against you because you don't know the terrain, you don't know the dangers of the region, wild animals, or where to find those in whom you seek. If they find out you're there and what your intentions are, you won't be successful in your quest and you might even lose your life. Or you manage to capture one or two. By dangling a carrot, you manage to get information from them that would make your job easier. You've gotten representatives of that region to deliver you to who you seek and to deliver them right into your hands. They are a great resource. So instead of taking them, you fill their pockets with niceties and employ them as your personal scouts. They've been instrumental in your success to where you finally captured enough to transport across the ocean where you can sell them like merchandise. You know you must overstock because you're sure to lose quite a few during the long journey. So let's fast forward. Now you've got the plantations full and teeming with free labor. And it's like picking apples off a tree. But you're finding that those who you have working against their will are resistant to the inhumane treatment that it takes to keep them in order. You begin having children with the women that you've bought or kidnapped. You're pleased to see that with every generation that passes, their skin seems to get lighter and lighter. Some know that you're their daddy and some don't. Some are even considering you to be their father and even trusting you with the secrets of the others. You find that to be a valuable resource, so you give them a simple place to live in your house and jobs around your place, like working, setting the table, serving dinner, sweeping, mopping, and all with the understanding that they would comply with every mandate that you've put in place. You're becoming fond of some of them, but will still inflict severe punishment on them should they get out of line. When there is a buzz in the air that there might be an escape attempt, you send them out to where the others are laboring in the field to gather intel. They consider you to be their father, so you know that they'll bring back the information that you've requested. They go out and betray the trust of the others, and when they return, you reward them with things like being your driver, giving them access to things that the others would never have access to, and allowing them to take the scraps that come from your dinner table. 
You know that obtaining order and maintaining control over the others would be a nightmare without their involvement. So you reinforce their trust in you by telling them things to make them think that you care for them. But they are merely a means to an end. And if they get out of line, you have no reservations about sending them into the fields to do hard labor with the others. After all, you don't really consider them to be equals, but you must admit without them, all that you've obtained would have been impossible. I hope they never realize the truth and that they will never have a seat at the table. So even though I wrote this based on the concept of the house slave and the part that they played in the lives of the other slaves, I want to relay a message and that this methodology has evolved into one that is no longer exclusively racially charged in part, but has been put into the controller's playbook as a method that works to control other people. The fight is no longer about black and white, but it's between the haves and the have nots, just like the scout on the beach. If we look hard enough, we will find those who aspire to be a have by double crossing the have nots. Some things never change, as the word of God says that there is nothing new under the sun. The only difference in this instance is that those who are involved have changed their clothes. And in some cases, their skin tone has changed as well. The only way to be victorious and not be captured on the beach, so to speak, is to recognize who the scouts are and oppose them corporately. This story is just an example of how disparities are allowed to continue to thrive against different groups of people and their communities. The word of God tells us that for all those who put their trust in him, this should be an issue that can be overcome as they have become the sons and daughters of the Most High God and should enter the battle knowing that they are more than conquerors. So let's stop seeing things in black and white and begin to see these things for what they really are, a battle between good and evil. Good doesn't have a color and neither does evil. Good is good and evil is evil, no matter what color. So having said that, it's time for all of us, black, white, red, brown, yellow, to take responsibility in order to ensure the outcomes that we are due. It's time for us to do what it takes so we can realize a change a change for the good and stop letting the enemy have his way by proxy. It's time to put our trust in God and let's get behind God-fearing women and men who have the best interests of the people at heart and in mind. Let's not settle for those who are satisfied with that dangling carrot and the benefit of eating scraps off the master's table. Let's pray for them and hope that they would wake up and realize that they will never really reap a harvest by being a scout, nor will they ever have prepared for them a seat at the table.